Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for the uh, panelist uh, session with the uh, a panel session with the analysts. Um, my name is Caroline McCrory. I'll be moderating this session. Um, do you want me to stand up? Yes. There you go. I am quite short. I can't. You can. There you go. Now, not all of you can see me. Right. Um, so. Um, I used to be head of product at Piston Cloud, um, and then I went off to GigaOM, which most of you know, GigaOM shut down, very sad. Um, I'm sure a lot of you miss it from the RSS feeds. So I'm actually very glad to be back with my fellow uh, news and uh, analyst folks to discuss uh, a few things about OpenStack. So I would like you to start by introducing yourselves. Hi, I'm Laurent Lachal. I work for Ovum, an industry analyst company based in the UK, which is part of the Informa Group, which is a huge conglomerate, about $2 billion uh, in size. And I specialize, I've been an industry analyst for about 25 years. In the past four years, I've been specializing in cloud. Thank you, Laurent. Frederic? Take the mic. Uh, my name is Frederic Ladinois. I write for TechCrunch, a Silicon Valley-based blog that's now owned by Verizon. Um, <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but I write about the cloud developer tools and the tendencies more on the technical side than, than anything else. And Al? Good afternoon. I'm Al Sadowski. I work for uh, 451 Research. Uh, I'm responsible for the uh, service provider channel, so everybody that uh, does private public cloud hosting of all sorts. And then I am uh, also focused on uh, this small little thing called OpenStack and uh, pretty much uh, all the different uh, business models and market size uh, re re related to that. I thought this was a Docker panel. Am I in the wrong room? No? <laughs> uh, I'm Sean Michael Kerr. I'm a senior editor at eWeek, uh, which is a Quinn Street Enterprise uh, publication. I also write for Internet News, Datamation, Server Watch, Linux Planet, a few others. I also manage a site called Linux Today. Uh, core focus for me is Linux Cloud, application development, and uh, security stuff, and happy to be here. Well, there you go. So the, uh, the first question that I have is quite a tame one, and uh, I'll, start, I'll start gently. So is OpenStack good for startups and you know, innovation, or is it just for the big players and major sponsors of the foundation? And I think I'll pick on Frederick for this one. <laughs> it's because we write about startups. Um, I guess there's two aspects to that. Is it good for startups in the ecosystem? And I would say, yes, absolutely. I mean, it seems to be doing, you know, going pretty well right now. There's plenty of startups doing all right. But there's also a risk, I think, with a lot of the big players now entering the market and, you know, the IBMs and everybody else joining, joining the game as well. So there's a risk there. The other aspect of it is, I think, is, is it a good platform for startups as well to use? And it seems like there's a lot to be done there still. I don't know of a lot of startups that are betting on OpenStack as a platform for their applications. It's definitely more on the enterprise side at this point. I think uh, but I see more startups trying to join the ecosystem rather than startups who are using OpenStack for their business. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Al, are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to ask you to clarify the question, but you just did, and thank you. But as far as a startup finding a niche within the OpenStack community to offer a product or service, there's obviously plenty of opportunity there. It's a you know growing market as we see over the uh, at, at these events every six months. The attendance gets uh, bigger and the yeah. uh, show the uh, marketplace area gets larger. So there's clearly some momentum. So plenty of opportunities. There's companies that built their business uh, ar around one specific OpenStack project. Um, you know, there's many, ha many have done that. Uh, I'm not going to call out anybody specifically in fear of forgetting someone, but there's mm -hmm. clearly opportunity. But the other part of the question about is some of the bigger vendors, uh, uh, sure, they have a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, large service provider has nine PTLs, uh, so clearly they have a lot of influence on the direction of, uh, of some of the projects. So. Yes, I would agree that. The well, then that I like what you, uh, you you bring up a good point with the with the PTLs. Um, Sean, how do you feel about some of the the PTLs who are also like, for example, Sibinano? Do you think the foundation is doing a good job with trying to get all the voices heard, not just from the community, but also from the people who are in the ecosystem trying to build yeah. their business? Uh, PTLs are really just uh, cat herders. So uh, in an open source community, they don't actually mandate anything. They just kind of line everything up, and then it's always should always be a meritocracy. So it's uh, 
for the people that have been PTLs, usually they tell me they, they do it because they have to. Uh, I think the OpenStack Foundation's done a really good job of transparency, of making sure that there's open levels of uh, contribution and that it's fair across multiple things. But more importantly, what we see, even even this morning, I talked about you know the app catalog. One of the annoying things for me is the app catalog, you could get Murano uh, apps, you could get a heat template, or you could get glance images. Mm -hmm. All three are the same, kind of, sort of, maybe. So if there is a project that somebody doesn't like because of a PTL or whatever, they just go start their own. Hmm. So there's going to be a lot of concurrent parallel efforts, and that's neither good nor bad. It's just choice. Okay, and Lauren, what do you think? Well, I concur with my fellow panelists. Then, yes, I think the, the foundation is, is because of the meritocracy that um, depends the whole process. Uh, it's not a, whether or not you're for working for a startup, it's whether or not as an individual you contribute to uh, the whole um, uh, development. In terms of um, star uh, startup using OpenStack, definitely uh, at the moment startups are, don't get any money to, for their own internal IT. They mm -hmm. start on the public cloud. So OpenStack would be uh, a platform not for a pure startup, but from a start for a startup which has uh, gone through some growth, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps needs its own infrastructure for whatever reason, um, and uh, so will then develop uh, its own uh, cloud, which then can be integrated with with uh, public cloud. I mean, Zynga is a good example of a of, of a long-standing uh, company which started small uh, on the Amazon Web Services, then developed its own. Uh, um, private cloud uh, mm -hmm. and now kind of ha has um, a, a, um, a workload life cycle approach to uh, to the way it uses the cloud when a game starts it starts on Amazon Web Services if it's successful it's, it's moved to the to their uh, um, private cloud I think the private cloud is cloud stack but it could very well be open stack right. and then towards the end of the of the the, the life of the, of the game it goes back uh, to, to die graceful death <laughs> on, on, on Amazon Web Services. So I think that's, that's how I, I see um, uh, your, your question. OK, so um, Sean, you raised a really good point about PTLs and you know, meritocracy and the projects and you know, governance-ish and thereabouts. So do you think that a tighter core of OpenStack projects, you know, like a ref stack, you know, like for example, with compute network and storage, something that needs to be really stable before other projects can be around, can wrap around it like an ecosystem. Do you think that's a good idea? Is that something that OpenStack should focus on? Uh, it is the, what they're doing, right? That's kind of sort of what DEF Core is, but the confusion is, uh, even though the initial bunch of projects are, you know, compute, uh, storage, networking maybe, and dashboard, there's other bits and those aren't core. So yeah, they're doing the right thing by focusing on core, core bits, and that's fine. Uh, when I think about it from a Linux perspective, though, Linux is a little bit different. Linux, you have user space. User space is user space. Once it's in user space, it's always maintained and it goes. I don't know if DEF Core will work that way or not. If it follows the Linux model, that would be great. If it doesn't, uh, not so great. But this is only the first release coming up, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Al, what do you think of it? Yeah, the, the only thing I would add, I think it creates some complexity for the distro providers to market their particular version. So they mm -hmm. have the you know regular six-month cadence of releases for the core. Now you have these other satellite projects that may have a different release cycle. Mm -hmm. And now they have to figure out when they are going to cut it off to form a package that they're now going to support. So instead of having, um, you know, vendor uh, mm. release based on kilo, now they got to think of maybe going to a release cycle that's less than or greater than six months, so that they can uh, line up some of those satellite projects into a an, into a pa supported. Pro I, I don't think there are that many enterprises would, that would be upgrading something like that every six months. Anyway. Enterprises that we talk to, uh, that's one of the knocks on, on OpenStack is that the it's too frequent, mm -hmm. um, the release cycle. So they like to you know hold off maybe a year or even longer. It, it, it's what they're used to with the, the legacy software that they've used. Right. And Frederick, you were? To me, it feels like it's um, a sign that the project is maturing in many ways as well, that that's becoming an issue at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, op I mean, OpenStack is so complex at this point that you do need some focus that just to keep it under you know, in check basically yeah. because there's so many side projects and so many little things happening that to focus on the three core areas I think makes perfect sense. 
well, there's, there's two elements to DevCore. The first element is marketing. Uh, it's about slapping uh, OpenStack logo onto your distribution. S and I think that's, that's good for everybody in the sense that you know what you get. Mm -hmm. um, and from a vendor point of view also, it's, it's kind of part of the marketing arsenal. Mm -hmm. From a technology point of view, it's about stability, reliability, etc. So I, I think, again, that's a, that's a win. And I would have liked DevCore to evolve a bit faster because the, the first the first certification it's it's early next next year but I think DevCore has really evolved nicely because last year it was uh -huh. very much uh, trying to boil down the the ocean, the ocean yeah. very philosophical and in the mean in in the nec la last few months it's, it's become much more pragmatic it's about you know let's get on with it start with with th the three core resources mm -hmm. and 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 do it so i think it at the way it's been uh, it's evolved from a management point of view has improved from a marketing point of view yeah why not it's a, it's a good development and from a technology point of view it's also it's a, i think it's a good development so it's a win 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 uh, um, at all levels okay so my next question is really around um, and I want, I want, I'm interested in Sean's perspective on, on this one, so I'm putting you on the spot there. What is OpenStack's biggest barrier to adoption in mid-market and enterprise? Now, we've touched on a few things. Yeah, yeah biggest Never. barrier in mid-market is obviously complexity. Uh, and I think when we're talking mid-market, it's in many cases, it's probably more than what a lot of organizations need, which is probably not what people want to hear in the bubble here at OpenStack. Uh, but it reminds me a lot of the early Java days, because early days in Java, Java was be all and end all. You had J2E, everybody plugged in. Uh, and then at some point, it got less complex with Tomcat. But then you know people started using Node, JavaScript, PHP, other things, other kind of uh, compiled languages. I think the same thing will happen here. So there's a lot of layers of complexity, management, and organizational pieces in OpenStack that are not necessarily required for smaller scale organizations. I think if you have, that's the beauty of Docker and containers, you have a host, you split it up, you don't need all those other uh, abstraction layers that OpenStack provides. So I think OpenStack in the mid and small sized business market as a, as a consumer maybe, if you're gonna roll your own, forget it. It's way too much complexity for those size of organizations. So, and you're talking about it from the complexity of using it as your own infrastructure as a and, service, and, yeah? and, and deployment, yeah. Because I, I can run, I can get a 2U server, run it in my office or in a mm -hmm. data center, run uh, Docker, uh, scale it up, and put a thousand virtual machines on it. I'm not going to do that with OpenStack. There's too much overhead. I think the upgrades, we, we already touched on the upgrade cycles is probably one of the, the big things. I mean, we've heard from Xerox, and they're using Folsom, and they said that they don't ever want to upgrade. I don't know if they've changed it now. It's been a year since they came out into the public and said they've got a 1,000 plus nodes running on Folsom. So um, what do you think, Al? Same question? Mm, yes, for the same question. But do you think application portability is an issue for people who, are already, who already have legacy apps and want to port it to OpenStack, yeah. but there's no real way of doing it? Yeah, so the, the, I've, and I've had this discussion with some of the vendors uh, today that in the case of VMware, you know, you can deploy your application in vCloud Air, you mm -hmm. can move it to uh, a hosting provider or, or a pub, uh, cloud provider that's based on VMware and you can pretty much drag and drop, it works fine. Mm -hmm. There's fear, uncertainty, and doubt that you can take a OpenStack-based workload or an application and move it from your private cloud mm -hmm. to a OpenStack-based public cloud or a private cloud with no interruption in, in I think a lot of those mm -hmm. things like federated identity mm -hmm. um, help, but there's still some work to, to do to ensure that an enterprise is not going to have an issue and not be locked into any particular one option. I thought, Lauren, you look like you had something you might, want to, you might have wanted to say on that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I just thinking federated identity is, is not quite, I wouldn't see that as part of that problem. Um, but it's true that that complexity is, is, an, is an issue. And what surpri has surprised me in, in, the, in the past few months has been the explosion in, in, in managed OpenStack. So, so mm -hmm. the, the first stage in managing the complexity has been the distribution, mm -hmm. which is there to, 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 to make the, the up, um, upstream code much easier to, to ingest. But even the distribution have, have, have been difficult to ingest because of the complexity as well as immaturity of, of, of OpenStack. And now you, you have all sorts of managed uh, offerings from Platform 9, which is completely SaaS, mm -hmm. to MetaCloud, which is uh, on-premise but uh, completely 
uh, uh, standardized to, uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, um, mirror Blue this. Box. Uh, Blue. Sorry? Blue box. Well, yeah, I don't know these guys, but to, <laughs> <laughs> to Mirantis uh, uh, was more of a custom one. Um, so uh, yeah, so th from that point of view, I think that's going to 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 make to make uh, adoption a little bit easier from from that point of view. Yeah. My only point, though, because the second question here was on application portability. From the Diablo release on, there was there's EC, there was an EC2 layer, mm -hmm. so compatibility even in the earliest days, you could always capture an image as a glance image then take it and then put it on another workload. So application portability is kind of built in always. Uh, it's more what you choose to dis deploy as your own infrastructure, which you want to manage, which is you know talking about the management is more complex. And, and everybody's going to say their management is going to make it easier. No one's going to say they're going to make it harder. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's uh, application portability I have to take as a, as a given unless you're, uh, yeah, just take it as a given. Well, but like you said earlier, right, this glance, this, 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 that, like which, which is the right way to do it, you know? Yeah. So, so I think I think uh, I think we might we might be almost be saying that certain OpenStack projects need to get out of each other's way so that they can make OpenStack as adoption a success. Wouldn't you say? What would you say would be a good measure of OpenStack adoption success? What would, sort of criteria would you, Frederick, put on it? Is it number of applications that are ported on it? Um, number of nodes? What is your criteria for measuring success? Number of production environments. I think at this point we're, we're seeing more and more of them, but I think. Just a question of who is adopting it and how you know how many people are adopting it, and especially maybe in the mid market, you know, coming going down from the enterprise level. Uh, just a question: who's yeah, complexity and everything? We just talked about that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard. You know, th I don't see it happening in the next year or two. But well, from your perspective, for our audience, would you say like if you have at least two apps running on pr in production on OpenStack, that's considered successful? Would you say 25? Or are you going to go based on number of nodes, like what Xerox does? What's a good way for them to try to quantify their, you know, what would be a good success criteria that we could give them? For, for the for OpenStack community? Or? For, for if they were looking at OpenStack, or, you know, to them, what do you, would you say is good adoption? So a couple for of themselves. Fortune 500 companies running production environments. You know, maybe 10, maybe a dozen companies you know, moving over. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> so number one, just increase, like every OpenStack Summit has exceeded attendance records. Mm -hmm. Each one, so consistently doing that obviously shows some momentum. Um, but one of the things that 451 Research has is the OpenStack Market Monitor. We, we, we actually have bottoms up estimates from over 70 vendors across a bunch of different business models. So if those numbers revenue wise from vendors who are here sponsoring this event they want to make money mm -hmm. if that revenue continues to go up i think that is uh, probably the uh, a very good measure of success whether it's from a distro provider mm -hmm. or a uh, hosted private cloud provider or a public cloud provider or a training vendor you know there's a number of different business models within the openstack ecosystem and if they continue to grow bigger than the general market then i think that's a, a, a probably the best measure of success for openstack go yeah i mean for, from a market point of view yes the success of openstack is a given i mean let's face it when you have hp ibm oracle mm -hmm. cisco um all the telco i mean all the telco providers huawei uh, uh, Ericsson, uh, Nokia, Alcatel, Lucent, everybody's betting the house on OpenStack. It is going to happen. Uh, so that, that, that's, you uh -huh. know, fine. Uh, in terms of ad, ad, uh, success from, a, I would say, an internal con consumption point of view, I would say it's when open s there's two elements. First is when OpenStack is moving out of its IT niche to, to be uh, the platform that the line of business people are going to, to go to naturally. And mm -hmm. I think the um, application catalog uh, uh, launched this, this morning will be an, an it's a, it's a nice development because basically it enables IT to go to the line of business people and say, okay, here, this is what you can run on OpenStack. So, so it kind of accelerates the, uh, the adoption. The second uh, kind of niche that OpenStack needs to get out of, so first, first niche is IT, the second niche is workload. At the moment, uh, OpenStack is mostly used for uh, kind of website type thing, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in bit of development. Um, uh, as uh, OpenStack 
becomes more important. It needs to, it's going to uh, run much more enterprise workload, OSS, BSS on the telco side, uh, business okay. application on the enterprise side. So it's when, when it's expanding from this IT niche to, to be something that the, the business audience will, will turn to naturally and from a, a, a workload niche to become a much more generic uh, operating system for the data center. Mm -hmm. then I think that that will be a, a, a good reflection of its success. I just want to jump in because, I uh, you know, we're, again, we're in the bubble, so I'll take the devil's advocate position. It, there's a lot of people here, which is great. Uh, you'll still see triple that at AWS reInvent, right? Yeah. So there's still more. Uh, AWS recently just broke out their numbers, $5 billion. What's the number for OpenStack? You would know better than I would. But it's not $5 billion. Uh, it's, it's, it's not. So is success for OpenStack being as big as Amazon? I don't know. That's a question maybe we could talk about. But what's interesting to me is uh, the first OpenStack vendor, uh, we'll call it Rackspace, is now no longer betting the farm on OpenStack. Mm -hmm. uh, in their recent third quarter uh, analyst call, they were saying how they're trying to de-emphasize that and focus just on support across multiple forms of infrastructure, including mm -hmm. potentially Amazon, Microsoft 360, et cetera. So I think that's very interesting to see that a vendor that bought bet the farm five years ago, on the verge of bankruptcy, may get, be getting bought out, who knows, is now, they own the farm, they own the farm exactly, yeah. are, are now uh, hedging their bets. And I think that's a leading indicator for what may be to come. Uh, I think, you know, adoption participation is fantastic, but the money side, I think uh, Rackspace may be the canary in the coal mine here. Well, the, the, most of the Rackspace farm is still running on, on open stock. Uh, yeah. So the, the fact that they are diversifying is more of kind of business model decision yeah. uh, 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 to, to go after several markets rather than uh, a, a decision to kind of move away from OpenStack. Uh, the same way Nebula uh, failure uh, to, to uh, as, as, as an enterprise is the, is the failure of Nebula, not the, not the failure of OpenStack. Sure. So I, I don't quite well, I, mean, so, so I don't quite buy that okay. that. I want to change the, the discussion. How many of you in here are actual enterprise users of OpenStack? Hands up, just give me a show of hands because there's, there's a reason for my question, right? So, so there, if we look at comp enterprises where they have a revenue of $25 million and up, they run on average 500 applications. And the reason why I asked, what would you guys as industry experts feel would be a measure of success for an enterprise who's using OpenStack? Was it one app in production on OpenStack or two or three when if the average is 500? You know, what is, good, what is a good measurement of success for anyone who's trying to justify running OpenStack as an enterprise? We understand as vendors who are trying to do it and get into the, you know, into the niche and into the business and everything else, but what, what does it really mean for somebody who is in an enterprise, who has a P&L, who needs to run services? Is OpenStack really something that they can bet their farm on and, and actually do that? Is it mature enough for them to be able to, to trust not just one app, but more of their apps? to actually run on it, and Frederick. Well, we, th there's plenty of telcos and everybody else who are running a lot of their apps on OpenStack already at this point, so if you want a number, I don't know, 25% or something like that, if their apps on OpenStack, it, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it matters all that much. Well, th I th think it's more of a question of how many how many customers are they supporting through OpenStack? That, yeah, for telcos, you know, I agree that's, that's a good that's a good measure, you know, success criteria. But I'm talking more for like a, from an enterprise perspective. Uh, what do you, you see a lot of enterprises? What would you recommend to them? For Forty-two. Them to, for if they were to adopt it. Forty-two. Forty-two is the answer. To there the answer go. to the ultimate question. <laughs> <laughs> we can go home. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. Um, I, I don't think there's a, an exact answer for any one enterprise. There's some enterprises that have made the decision that by 2012, 100% of their apps are going to be running in OpenStack. Mm -hmm. They've made that requirement. There's others that are just now kicking the tires and they have DevOps uh, only in mm -hmm. OpenStack and are, and are running all their production in VMware. Like, there's no single right answer for enterprise. Okay. It really is. Let's take a question. So the question was, um, for the sake of the recording, um, would OpenStack be a de facto standard for private cloud? Um, and will it also end up being largely a threat? And would it be largely irrelevant in public cloud? I, I think some would argue that it is the de facto standard for open source 
uh, private cloud now, uh, but VMware still has a pretty sizable market share uh, currently. But I, it, I don't, I, I don't know if I would say that it is going to be the de facto for all private, but definitely the de facto for any open source private clouds. Sure. Yeah, my, and, uh, I think AWS is the de facto standard for, for public. public at this point. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't disagree with that. On the um, on the private side, if we take this big tent model where everybody is welcome, including Microsoft and VMware, then everybody already is OpenStack. Uh, if Citrix, Microsoft, VMware are all supported in a private OpenStack kind of distribution through APIs, then it's, it's done. It, everything is OpenStack. It's the big tent. Everybody's welcome. It's just how you uh, divide up pieces. Yeah. Go ahead. So you, you mentioned about the complexity of open stack. It's not like open stack, it's very open stack. And I think that's very true, and that's why companies like Narantis and Red Hat or, or Uber provided the service for, for, for people to require open stack. But I think for, for open stack to be successful, you also have to think about um, performance. So the comment from the floor was that uh, OpenStack needs to make it uh, a lot more uh, stable, um, also has good performance metrics, and also a way for them to actually measure true performance, just mm -hmm. like the Google release that's allowed to do that. Um, yes? So, Carol, I'd just like to turn that question around. How many apps does it take to make something successful? PayPal is processing 100% of their payments on OpenStack today. Are they not successful? Do they employ more apps? So, so Right, so this is why this is this is but this is this is this raises the point. So the the, the, the point that was given by my IBM friend over there was that um, PayPal use, does uses OpenStack for their payment processing and it's basically one app. Is that does that con constitute not being a success or being a success? And I suspect I'm going to get a counter here from the front of the audience. So, so the counter was if it took them twice as much infrastructure as far as hardware, network, and people to actually do their payments processing on OpenStack versus if they didn't, then it may not have been a success. So I think we're clear that success criteria varies based well, on uh, uh, your wallet. Uh, there was, there was a, we had an industry analyst uh, session uh, afternoon I yesterday where the, the foundation got mm -hmm. us to talk with quite a few uh, uh, companies. Uh, one of them, I don't remember whether they attended or not, so I'm not going to mention th their name, but differently what they had done, because they, w they are a financial institution, is that they, are, they had uh, costed the actual cost base uh, prior to OpenStack down, according to the guy we talked to, to the uh, uh, cost of the cable uh, running on the, on the floor. And uh, and then afterwards with, with OpenStack, and it was, uh, you know, l more than half the, 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 the end result was uh, 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 much lower cost with OpenStack than it was uh, with a uh, uh, prior uh, architecture. So it's, it, it, it indeed depends on how well you architect uh, OpenStack. It also uh, uh, depends on how well you understand your cost base. Uh, and some people will, will be more uh, um, able to kind of understand that than others. I'm not sure, uh, but so, so the, uh, the, the so answer was that there was yeah. operational costs included in the. But it's a good question. Yes, you, you need to, to do that as well. So um. there was a question on that side. Yes.
the larger markets or the small or the mid market? The telco market. Okay, so the question was when would OpenStack embrace the telco market, which is a you know billions and billions. Well, OpenStack of dollars. has embraced the telco market, uh, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. I mean, you are way as 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 embraced. Uh, so as, as I was saying, you are way Ericsson, uh, uh, Alcatel, Lucent, Nokia. Who else? I mean, all the big telco. Well, 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 so let's let them clarify. So, so you're, what you're saying is, is when is OpenStack going to understand better telco operating models and factor that into to the techno and embrace that? Te okay. Uh, just like, um, very quickly, uh, you're, in terms of global issue, you're right. We're talking about uh, OpenStack being the Linux of of uh, uh, infrastructure as a service. It's not the big difference between OpenStack and Linux is that enterprises don't contribute to Linux, and and but the like of PayPal and uh, Comcast uh, contribute huge amount to OpenStack. Do they have a voice uh, uh, in the foundation which uh, uh, truly reflects their, their their contribution? Answer: No, uh, and that's one of the the failing of the. I mean. I think the, the foundation is doing a good job at that level. It's one of the areas they should do much better, and I've been telling that, that telling them that for, for, for a while. So it's it's not just telco; it's a more generic thing. But it's, you're right from a telco as well. It's kind of compounded by the fact that there is a IT versus telco universe convergence, and uh, and not yet the, the mentality have not yet kind of adapted to that convergence situation. Okay, wait. So hold on. So you have something to add, and then I'm going to come to you. Uh, so Michael Dolls with American Airlines. I actually thought a lot of the things that were happening in the network side were actually being driven by people like NTT um, to actually support the telco thing. Um, and depending on if you feel Time Warner or a telco or not, um, that I, I was seeing those types of um, entities that were media content providers, um, and depending on if you consider telcos content providers, um, that's where I was kind of seeing a lot of these things that were being driven in the container space and in the tenant space where that really didn't benefit the enterprise. Uh, so actually, was, I'm actually here fighting to make sure that uh, enterprise isn't forgotten. That we don't <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, so it's good to see you again, by the way. OK, and then, um, wait, so you, so. Um, so right Thank now you, we're Wendy. seeing uh, a lot of companies building private clouds. Um, and I suspect because they don't want to go near kind of data security and privacy issues of using the public cloud. That people are making that decision based on like FUD, and I in the future, will it seem crazy to have built a private cloud and everyone will be using public cloud? So, just to repeat the question, um, most a lot of companies are going with private cloud because of the security element, and they is it FUD or is it real, or will they regret the decision? And uh, I'll give that to Al because he's been dying to say something. <laughs> Analysts not wanting to talk. <laughs> Shocking. Um, so think back a number of years uh, with co-location. Uh, people wanted to deploy their servers somewhere near where their office was, you know, the, the server huggers. And as they evolve to cloud, that's kind of their, you know, next step. They want they don't want to give up and put it out into a, a hosted environment. They still want, you know, a little bit of access. Compliance regulatory is definitely a big piece of that and uh, based on our like voice of the enterprise research which now covers over 10,000 users 30 percent of cloud budgets are private cloud uh, focused so there is a lot of interest backed up by data that shows that people want to build private clouds and that is their foundation for a hybrid environment we like to say the road to hybrid is private and th there's a foundation of private coupled with you know another private cloud or public cloud to, to build a hybrid environment and showing them because it's security that's come up yeah the security is hard whether it's public or private and it really it all comes down to configuration so sometimes uh, it's 
whether it's private or public, so long as it's managed, because no individual organization has the skills, resources, and talent to do security properly today, which is another point because we only have five minutes left. Uh, I think security is the largest single under-discussed topic in OpenStack, and it is a ridiculously huge issue, and I think it is obscene that there isn't a key management project as part of DEF Corps, which means all these connections between the different pieces, uh, you're connecting from Horizon to Keystone to this and that over SSL TLS, who's managing the keys? Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's not defined. I don't care whether it's private or public, that's a question that needs to be answered with anyone that's deploying. So my closing question, which you all have one bullet each that you can fire, what is the most annoying thing that a vendor will not talk about, they're unwilling to talk about when you ask them um, that, we, because that's a good nugget, because analysts always get one question that analysts will never answer. So I'll start with Laurent. One, just one. Go, before we end. Uh, What's the one thing you, that annoys you the most that a vendor will not answer? The one question that you have that they won't answer? Pass, because they, they usually answer my questions. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK, Frederic. <laughs> Real usage numbers and user numbers. There you go. Al? I was going to say say the same thing, like how many customers, how much revenue by specific Industry private verticals. cloud, for, for, yeah, it, it, exactly, the, the, the metrics that have dollar signs next to them typically. Sean? Failures. Nobody wants to tell me about failures. Everyone wants to tell me about lighthouse wins. I want to know when things failed uh, and then how they fixed them and rarely do I get that. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for coming and it was nice to get like questions from the floor. Thank you.